Hello guys! Uh, we have today our um, Kuya Mike in town. <laughs> yeah, he is uh, my brother here, my big brother actually, since I came here. Kuya Mike Wallace. <laughs> Hello Kuya Mike, how are you? Hello. Can we stop and... I, I keep looking at the camera. Stop it. Right. <laughs> Hello guys, we're glad to have um, one of kind uh, man that I met here in Canada, my very own Kuya, my big brother here since I got to uh, be here. Kuya Mike Wallace. Hello, Mike. Um, can we start to your uh, childhood? Then? Okay, where, sure. Where are you from? Where are you grown up? Mm -hmm. um, well, my parents came to Glasgow, and uh, uh, we lived on the west side of town on uh, Victoria Avenue. And then I think before I was born, uh, we moved to uh, Acadia Street on the east side of town. Mm -hmm. And um, most of our children, or my parents' children, were born here. Uh, I have you know, nine brothers and sisters, so there was ten of us in total. And uh, one of them, uh, the youngest, uh, was born in Ontario. You said just one sister? No, the youngest sister. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, six brothers, six boys, oh. four girls. Ten oh, children. Yeah. Yeah. I thought she was a princess yeah. in the family. <laughs> <laughs> well, she always did feel that she was the favorite. <laughs> but ten was a small family. My uh, my father's uh, parents had fifteen children. Ooh. So uh, certainly back then it was uh, much more common to have uh, large families. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Always lots of other kids to play with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So maybe some of your uncles uh, or aunties are the same age with you, you know? Uh, at one point we had a, uh, uh, a reunion, mm -hmm. and I think it was for my grandmother's, um, I think it was her 90th birthday. Mm -hmm. But at that time there were 65 cousins. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> it, it, the number is higher now, but then of course there's yeah. you know, cousins and second cousins and uh, much mm -hmm. larger. You know, mm -hmm. Actually, talking about uh, you know cousins or aunts and uncles, just uh, on December twenty first uh, of last year, uh, we went to the one hundredth birthday of my aunt uh, Ruth. Wow! Yeah, and uh, you know we went to dinner, and so for two three hours she was the life of the party, yeah. telling jokes and telling stories. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> one story was uh, in the Second World War uh, they were. Um, uh, she was part of a club, the White Walton Club, and they would, uh, you know, they, they would hold dances. And so when the ships would come in, they'd, they'd phone the club and say, well, we, you know, we need, uh, you know, 30, 40 uh, girls for a dance tonight. And so the sailors would come and all the girls would show up and they would have a dance. And uh, so we're talking about this and she looks up to me and she says, and you never asked me to dance with me. Yeah. And... Uh, did she ask dance for you? <laughs> well, I, I was too polite to tell her I wasn't even born then. <laughs> right. But anyway, that's uh, mm -hmm. the last aunt of my, on my father's side. Mm -hmm. So uh, of the 15 children, well, she's 100, but she's the last one. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you grown up, uh, where, where did you grow up? Uh, well, we were here on the, uh, uh, the other side of town, on Acadia Street. Mm -hmm. And... Um, like one uh, lived in a house, uh, a big house. Um, I can remember going up to, uh, coming down from Shelburne Street on Cottage Street and uh, coasting in the winter. 
So my father would take us over there and we'd go coasting. Um, and, and back then the parents would also just let the kids go out the door. Uh, they weren't as protective of children back then. I think it was a safer, a safer time, right? Uh, no, we, was just, we went up the street and, and over on Brookside Avenue and then up the hill. So no, it wasn't another house, it was just that that was a good place to go coasting, you know, to go sliding down in the snow. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay, so you've grown up in a Catholic tradition. Yes, that's right. Um, so, mm -hmm. what's in your heart during those, uh, you know, growing up until you become a young man? Uh, well, we lived close to the church, actually. The mm -hmm. church wasn't far away, and we went to the Catholic school. Um, <clears throat> And you know, those were good experiences. Mm -hmm. um, I think we lived in fear of uh, the nuns. Yeah. I can, one nun, uh, I forget her her proper name, but uh, we called her Muscles. Uh, and uh, she would, uh, you know, strap you. And I don't think I ever got hit, but she would strap or hit the other children if she doesn't think they were, didn't think they were obeying. Um, I remember one day, uh, we were on the first floor, but it was probably at least, you know, at least 10 feet, 11 feet off the ground, and uh, probably grade four or five. But uh, we heard a motorcycle come up, so we all went over to the window, and one of the boys in the class, you know, opened the window, jumped to the ground, and drove off on the motorcycle. And so, you know, we're in grade four or five, and like this was, you know, this was astounding that anyone would escape school on a motorcycle. <laughs> And uh, I remember his name, and uh, it was just one of those interesting events, right? One of the, you know, I don't remember a lot of details, but that was, a, you know, that was an historic day. I think up to grade five, then. Yeah. Know. So you're one of the outstanding, you know, caring young men. <laughs> <laughs> Is that in your notes? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I, I wasn't, uh, you know, I was quiet. Uh, mm -hmm. I was certainly an introvert. Um, <clears throat> But, um, you know, we had fun in those days, you know. Uh, over at the school, they used to take the, uh, the uh, a fire hose and spray it over the whole uh, parking lot. Mm -hmm. And so we would, uh, you know, just play on that and they would put it over the bank mm -hmm. and uh, make like holes in the snow. Mm -hmm. So we'd slide down, you know, through tunnels in the snow. Oh, nice. And uh, <laughs> those were good days, you know, yeah. we had lots of fun. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we had a good childhood. You know, certainly lots of kids, so there's always lots of people to play with, lots of stuff to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we spend every, a lot of time every outside. Every season, there are some kind of <laughs> games that you're enjoying. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So, so you go abroad, right? Uh, what's uh, what makes you go there to the um, Well, I can remember you know going to the Catholic Church. And, uh, you know, we went to catechism and we went to church and, uh, you know, uh, as I was growing up, I didn't I ever, you know, disliked it or rebelled against it. But uh, then I recall as I was getting older um, and, uh, you know, maybe 13, 14, you know, 15, uh, I remember uh, the Apostles' Creed and I started at the bottom of it and uh, I began to say to myself, well, I don't believe that. And, uh, you know, I, well, I don't believe that. And sort of slowly, in the church, we always said the Apostles' Creed, you know, during Mass on a Sunday. And uh, I would just stop saying the things uh, that I decided I no longer believed. And um, so it was sort of a slow process, but I, I just remember that. And I got to the point where, by the time I finished grade 12, and I went to St. Evex, with Catholic University, um, you know, I, I realized, well, I, I don't believe anything that, that I'm being told in the church. And uh, so when I got to the university, um, I was essentially an atheist. And I just recall that, you know, during that period, you know, to me, it didn't make any sense that, you know, that God even existed. Uh, I was in university for three years, and it might have been in my second year that I began to reason uh, well, uh, maybe God existed, but I didn't know how to, you know, how to get to know him. And um, uh, that would make me an agnostic, 
the idea that you know there is a God, but there's no way to know Him, or you know, that He's just too far away. Um, uh, but before I, the third year, um, I don't know what happened, but I just began to, you know, you know maybe it was just because I was, uh, you know, thinking things through in my head. But then I began to think, well, maybe there's something to this, and I began to read the Bible. So I think I read the whole Bible. Uh, at least by the end of my third year of university. And, and that really started me on a search. Um, I didn't then conclude what I believe what the Catholic Church told me, but I, I thought, well, there must be a truth out there. And, um, you know, I'm not sure what it is, but I, I think I want to find it. So uh, I, I stayed in university for three years. I just decided I wasn't going to finish. I think at that time I was just more f interested and focused on, you know, finding out what was the truth. And, you know, the idea of, of just finishing university and buying a house and living in the suburbs. And I remember that's how I, I viewed it, that that just wasn't important. That there were you know, more things, things that were more important than that. Um, so I, I stopped university. I traveled to uh, Ontario, stayed there for about 10 months and uh, just began the process of uh, of searching. Um, I, I looked into, uh, you know, a guru, I think his name at that time was Guru Maharaji, mm -hmm. and um, I just decided that wasn't the truth. Uh, I was in, in Toronto, so I met people from Hare Krishna on the streets, the ones they were chanting, and, you know, would have talked to them. Uh, there was a, a group called uh, uh, Mary Baker Eddy, and uh, kind of forget the title, something about science, Christian Science, and Mary Baker Eddy, and uh, you know, got to know some people from that organization, uh, but you know, just didn't feel there was any any truth in it, that you know, it wasn't the you know the, the answer. I think in each group, I I found something that appealed, but then the, then I just discounted it, said, well, no, that really can't be right, that can't be the you know the truth. Um, so it was sort of a process of, you know, searching and eliminating. Um, I, I, I finished work in maybe, uh, you know, April of that year or, you know, April, May, and uh, traveled out west, but uh, ended up going down to Spokane, Washington. And uh, this was uh, probably the biggest moment for me up until that point in time. Um, I was hitchhiking, so staying at a place that was inexpensive was important. So I found out that there was a, a, a Christian youth hostel. Mm -hmm. And um, so they provided a bed and, and, a, and you know, supper, breakfast, and I think it only cost three dollars. Mm -hmm. And, um, but if you were going to stay, you had to go to the meeting. And I can picture the building, it was like a house, and you came in and the meeting room was on the right. And I went to the meeting, mm -hmm. and I don't, I know I went because I, I wouldn't have been able to stay if I didn't. Don't remember what was said, but it was, they were talking about you know Jesus and Christianity. And um, so then we went up to bed, and because we had so many kids in our family, we always had bunk beds. You know the beds where you know we had the lower bed and the upper bed. So I was you know used to sleeping on a bunk bed. And um, in the lower or in the well, I you know I mean, sometimes I'd be on the lower and some. So you know, it, idea. Yeah, it depended. It depended where the fight was. If we were fighting on the lower one, I was there, or we were fighting on the upper one. And um, but so we went upstairs, and all the boys were in one room, and there could have been as many as six bunk beds, you know, six, seven, and I was on the top bunk bed. So you know, nothing out of the ordinary. And uh, I just remember waking up, fully awake. I had, you know, rolled out of the bed. I was fully awake. And I was falling, and I was falling straight down on my knees. And I was aware that I'm falling. And when I hit the floor on my knees, I, I thought, "This is the posture of prayer. God's talking to me. God wants to speak to me." And then my next thought was, "I got to get back up so no one knows who fell out." And so I got right back up in the bed, uh, <clears throat> and maybe seven or so in the morning, when people were waking up, someone said, "Who fell out?" And uh, I didn't say it was me, but um, that was a moment where um, I was searching for God, 
and I really knew that God was trying to get my attention. And the fact that it was in a Christian um, hostel, and they had talked to me about Jesus the night before, you know, the night before in the meeting, uh, that just sort of stayed in my head. So that's the beginning of the conviction. The Not there was no conviction of sin. There was just an awareness, uh, probably the opposite of being agnostic. An agnostic doesn't believe that we can know God, that we can, you know, communicate with Him. And that was a moment where uh, I would say I believed that God could speak to me because I really felt He was trying to say something to me, right? And you know, if I thought it through, it would have been that Christianity is, you know, the answer. Um, but the journey continued, and um, <clears throat> I traveled from uh, Spokane, Washington back to Columbus, Ohio on freight trains. There was a, uh, a freight train called the Burlington Northern Railway and I was told that the, the motto of the owner was bums built my railway and forever shall they ride free. And so I was told you know you go down to the railway tracks you, you find a call box just a phone they're on the tracks you know among all the trains you know you pick up the box and uh, talk to the station master and uh, tell him you want to go east and he'll tell you what track what train number and what time is leaving so uh, we got a free ride over two-thirds of the united states and uh there was me and other people uh, but it was a it was a magnificent journey uh, but it was secondary to the uh, journey of, of faith of searching for you know for the meaning of life <clears throat> So, so when is the time that you went to Spain? Well, I, I came back from that trip mm -hmm. and I stayed in New Glasgow. Uh, I got a job uh, working for the uh, Mentally Challenged mm -hmm. and uh, I stayed there for the year. And um, then that, uh, you know, that June, I went to Europe mm -hmm. and uh, I traveled uh, through Europe, I hitchhiked and uh, mm -hmm. had, you know, many great you know, adventures, uh, met a lot of people. A lot of people would pick you up and you know, take you to their home and yeah, you'd have supper and get to know them and they'd drive you back to the road and you'd continue on. But uh, I do remember uh, going to Edinburgh, Scotland and um, sitting on a park bench and I think it was two people came up and sat down on the bench with me and told me about Jesus. Now, once again, I don't remember uh, what the conversation actually was. But uh, even at that time, you know, a month later, I didn't really think about what the conversation was. But I, I knew that, you know, these were Christians. They were telling me about Jesus and uh, that, you know, it was something important. So I remember that very clearly. Um, <clears throat> about that uh, hitchhiking feel like, <laughs> I'm just uh, curious, is it hard, you know, that somebody will, you're just beside the road and the uh, hitchhiking? <laughs> Is it the... No, no, Ellie. What's the point? <laughs> you, you have to turn it this way. Oh, it's you, you, you have to turn your thumb. I'm not there this time. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Now, this means you, you, know, you want to go to heaven. Or this means you want to go down the road. Ah, <laughs> uh, all right. It's um, cold outside, Kilimic. So, is it hard? You know, pray. Are you praying that somebody will uh, uh, trust you and pick you up? Uh, not in those days because I was searching for God, but I wasn't praying to God, right? But um, I think we were just comfortable. It was a safer time. Um, a lot of people were hitchhiking. You know, when I hitchhiked across Canada, um, you know, there'd be lots of other people on the road. Today, you don't see people hitchhiking. Today, there's a fear that the hitchhiker is going to, you know, harm you in some way. But, um, no, you know, we had a great time and, you know, I usually hitchhiked alone. But in, in Europe, uh, there was one or two times where I went places where I was a lot comfortable. But generally speaking, you know, there was never any fear because, you know, you got picked up by people who were just being helpful. And, uh, you know, Germany was a great country to hitchhike through. Uh, lots of people, uh, you know, shared a lot of their experience. and. Uh, yeah, so no, fear wasn't a big part of it, it was just, a, it was an adventure, oh, right? <laughs> um, I went to Switzerland and on the adventure side, I keep talking about winter things, but I had a small tent. 
So I, I hitchhiked through Wichita and got into where the mountains were. And I wanted to go and, uh, you know, camp my tent where no one else was around. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I kept walking and walking and I walked up a hill and, um, you know, kind of got under some trees and set up my tent. And I couldn't see any people. But uh, the following morning, uh, I, I heard people and they were skiing on the other side. So I got as far away as I could and I, you know, stayed alone and uh, there was a lot of snow. It was quite cold actually, but uh, yeah, it was a great adventure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, so when is the time that uh, you really get the conviction? We're, we're getting there. Is there. God and the... <laughs> um, so I, after Edinburgh, I, I went around, you know, Scotland, England, Wales, then over to Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, went down through you know France and Spain and went into Morocco. So I was actually on a beach in Morocco and um, uh, two fellows, Dorian Moore and uh, Don Patterson, both Canadians, you know, they came over and talked to me. And so for, well, they were living in Spain and they had come down to Morocco for maybe two weeks and they were, you know, looking for people from you know, English speaking countries that they could talk to. Okay. So in that sense, they were missionaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was intrigued by what they had to say and, uh, you know, listened to them a lot. Um, during that, maybe the one week period that I was there, I uh, saw the two most magnificent uh, sunsets I'd ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. And one of them, there were 11 different colors in the sky. Oh. And another one, you know, when you see the rays of light mm -hmm. and uh, like depicting the glory of God. Uh, it was just uh, astounding. Mm -hmm. And this was a time when they were talking to people with Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I made the decision that I would go to um, Fuengarola or Tormelinas mm -hmm. uh, in the south of Spain, and this is where the community was. <clears throat> so I continued traveling through Baraka. I was there for about a month, and I, I went to the community uh, in Spain. And they, they went by the name of the Evangelical Community Church. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the, uh, the pastor was Daniel Del Vecchio, Daniel and Rhoda Del Vecchio. And um, it was made up of young people from Canada, United States, Europe, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. You know, a lot of young people who were hitchhiking. And uh, they ended up, uh, or in some cases, they came over for a two week vacation and they met someone and uh, would stay for, you know, about six months or a year. But uh, in the community, I, um, I quickly believed what they were saying and, and really felt, you know, this is the truth. These people are, you know, telling me things and they were telling me that their lives were changed. And, and uh, I, I found it amazing that, you know, that this person who said that they used to be, you know, a thief or a drug addict or an alcoholic or whatever their story was, that, you know, they were actually this changed person in front of me. And I found that amazing that they were, you know, just so completely transformed mm -hmm. that I couldn't comprehend of them being what they said they used to be. And, um, but I couldn't come to believe that I had changed. You know, intellectually, I was believing what was being told me, but I didn't believe it in my heart. Uh, there was just a wall that, you know, that this change had happened for me. And uh, there was a fellow there by the name of Barry Butters. He was from Australia. And um, uh, he, he had had you know, quite a few dreams and visions. And uh, one day, he, uh, um, it was probably the Friday night meeting. And uh, he was telling a story from the dream that he had the night before. And so he's, in the story, he said that a friend of his was in a, a Western style saloon. A Western style bar where you know there's drinking and and gambling and music, but that uh, there was a, a fight broke out and the fight broke out you know downstairs in this saloon, and then there was a curved staircase going up and there was the second story inside the building and there was a, a railing so you have railings on your staircase, but a railing on the uh, the balcony on the second floor. And so the fight breaks out down on the lower floor and this fight is going up the stairs and these two kind of like Western style fight uh, are fighting their way up the stairs. But then when they get to the railing and, and the fight is continuing, 
And I, I've begun to identify with the friend. So I was totally committed to this you know, story that Barry was telling. And as he's fighting with his friend, you know, I'm fully believing that he's fighting with me. And uh, the, the friend, it wasn't Barry in the fight, but, uh, but I was the friend in this fight. And uh, up against the rail, and, and Barry's telling the story, and the railing is the separation between, you know, earth and hell. And, and suddenly I'm aware that if I go over the railing, I'm going to fall into hell. And I'm struggling against this. And, and suddenly I, I cry out, uh, you know, a loud cry, because I, I have this sense that I've got to fight, otherwise I'm going to fall into hell. And in that moment, I called out to God, and I was saved from the fires of hell, you know, through the story, this dream that Barry told. And um, in the book of Jude, it, it says, and of some, uh, you know, just pulling them out of the fire, saving them. And uh, that's what I felt. It was like being pulled out of the fire. You know, uh, hell had become, uh, before it, had been, it was abstract, but hell became a very real place. And, um, you know, I knew I was saved in that moment. I'd been saved from hell. So, so then, after you that dream, what is your reaction now that are you looking for someone to explain to you, you know, about that saving kind of Jesus Christ? Um, I think at that point, I'd been in the community for what was really considered a long time. Mm -hmm. To be there a month, uh, and actually, you know, constantly, you know, every day, someone was talking to you mm -hmm. about you know, faith in Jesus, and uh, you know, it wasn't like you went to church once on Sunday. You were living in the community, and people were always, you know, interested in explaining things to you. So, uh, in that moment, I understood that I was saved. Right prior to that, I, I didn't believe it, but that, um, you know, in the meeting, listening to that story, uh, I, you know, I fully believe that. Uh, I was saved from hell and that Jesus was the one who saved me. So I, I continued to, to live in the community. Um, <clears throat> probably three months after I you know, arrived, they bought a farm. And so I went out to work in the farm. Didn't really want to. Uh, but then slowly I began to look around and I realized that uh, there weren't many other people there. And then uh, suddenly I was in charge. <laughs> so for five years I, I was in charge of the farm. And uh, it might have taken me three years to accept the fact that that was my job. Uh, but uh, it was a great experience. Um, you know, we would go out on the street, uh, you know, Wednesday nights uh, or Sunday evenings and uh, invite people to come to church. And um, that was always, uh, you know, we enjoyed doing it uh, because you know, it was real. So you know, do you think you'll become a missionary person? <laughs> Well, in a sense, we were, you know, we were in a foreign country. Yeah. Uh, we were living, you know, in a community. Uh, but, you know, now we were, I didn't speak Spanish, uh, but we were, so we were evangelizing any English-speaking people. Our first line when we would come up to them on the street would be, do you speak English? <laughs> and um, so, uh, you know, we had many, many conversations and many people, almost every week, some of us say. So some of the Espanol are also they're talking in English or just well, we, any of us who spoke Spanish would have you know spoken uh, to the uh, the Spanish people and mm -hmm. uh, the community began as an English speaking but then eventually the Spanish community you know outgrew. I remember looking at a picture once and I think there were fifteen Spanish pastors in it and I might have known that ten or eleven of them uh, had been drug addicts and alcoholics. But uh, you know they had you know matured to the point where they were actually pastoring small churches in different places, but mostly in the south of Spain. So yeah, it was uh, it was an adventure for sure. Mm -hmm. So you stayed in Spain for more than five years. Uh, I was yeah I was in the, in the community for about five and a half yeah, mm -hmm. and in Europe for about six and a half years. Mm -hmm. yeah. So <clears throat> so when you decided to come back here in Canada, um, maybe you're looking for the right church now? Uh, I'd come home once before then, mm -hmm. you know, just for a visit, mm -hmm. so I knew of one church, 
And, um, but when I came home, you know, finally, I, um, uh, I think I already knew the church I was going to go to. Uh, well, maybe not entirely, because uh, when I finally came home, I, I went around to different churches, and maybe five or six. And interestingly enough, in each church that I went to, they invited me to come up and speak, you know, just to talk uh, about my experiences, and which was unusual for me because when I was in Spain, uh, I was too afraid to speak, you know, and, very, and rarely spoke. I was in the community for three years before I ever spoke up in, you know, the Friday night meeting. That's when people were sitting in the living room, and and uh, I think the pastor knew that I had never spoken up. Uh, because I, I asked a question, I think, and it was 11 words, and he asked me to repeat it. Mm-hmm. So I doubled my uh, words in, you know, in, in a minute. <laughs> but I had never spoken up for three years because I was just too afraid to. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy in your mind to think, well, yeah. you know, I, I have nothing to say or no one wants to listen to me or mm-hmm. just to allow fear to keep you from you know, speaking. But um, so I ended up going to uh, the Calvary Temple <clears throat> and uh, uh, sh- shortly before I got there, uh, Bruce Morrison came and he was the pastor of the church. So he's, he's the pastor of our church here now currently. <clears throat> yeah. okay. And then then after that, clear your mind, how long did you, uh, you know, having that, uh, how many decades before you met Irene? <laughs> oh, we're jumping way ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it was a, it was a while. And, yeah, but, but uh, you have your own family, right? Before Arlene. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I have two children, uh, Susan and Hannah. Mm-hmm. Susan's a nurse, and uh, Hannah's an accountant. Mm-hmm. And um, but uh, for meeting uh, Arlene, well, actually, I remember uh, you know here at this church. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, we had you know lots of people coming to the front of the church, and I remember one day, you know, being up and going over to Arlene, who was sort of in the center of the church on the front, and asking her to go over to the the right of, of the church and to pray for someone, and uh, you know it um, you know, might have shocked her a bit, but anyway, uh, you know, so she went over and she prayed for the person, and I think also. Uh, if not on that occasion, other occasions, you know, you know, I would say, well, you know, pr- pray in uh, Tagalog, you know, you, you don't want to pray in English. Um, but anyway, that was probably the first time I spoke to her. And uh, we... Uh, uh, you felt something? Or... <laughs> well, not necessarily the first day, but uh, I, I was impressed with her, huh? you know, with the way she carried herself. And she was very beautiful. And uh, she was a committed Christian and willing to, uh, you know, willing to participate and minister in the church. Um, so uh, a- after a while, uh, we were both teaching Sunday school, and uh, you become partners in the as teacher in Sunday how, school. How did that happen? <laughs> Who orchestrated that? <laughs> so we were teaching Sunday school. And so uh, I might have asked her the night before, you know, maybe I phoned her, you know, just to talk about the Sunday school lesson the next day, but that I asked her to, you know, go for dinner after Sunday school. And so, uh, you know, she maybe reluctantly said yes. And so we taught the Sunday school and often it takes longer to finish up and clean up the room and then, you know, head out. So by the time we're, go- we're you know, going upstairs and, and outside, she looks around and realizes there's no one else there. So she thought it was a group dinner for all the Sunday school teachers, but it was just her and I. <laughs> so, um, so is it for, for you, is it, you know, it's a date or just? Uh, for me, it was a date because I knew that oh, it was okay. just her and I. Oh, you but planned she was, it, you planned it I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't plan it, Ellie. <laughs> Yes, just, but she thought just, um, she thought it was with a group of Sunday school teachers. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Um, not that I deliberately tricked her. I, I assumed that she knew it was just the two of us. But then we, we went to uh, the the Dine and Dash in Trenton, mm-hmm. 
and is no longer by that name. Um, but two other people from the church showed up, and so they ended up sitting at our table. Mm -hmm. So uh, it did become a group dinner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe but, that, that uh, mm -hmm. feeling, you know, it, it is to our <laughs> That, uh, oh, Ellie, Ellie, Ellie keeps looking over this way because <laughs> Arlene is off camera. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, Koya Mike, I know there are some. So you're courting Arlene, right? And then uh, um, there are some, you know, struggles or situations or something happening that during your dates and your courting. So what makes you decide that uh, this lady is from God sent her to me? I'd like to <laughs> I'd like to say that it was like a bolt of lightning and <laughs> and uh, you know the, the next the next week I was down on my knees proposing. <laughs> but I was I was a bit reluctant and slow. And uh, it took it took four years, wow. right? And uh, but uh, you know, uh, I was convinced of you know her character and uh, and uh, who she was, and uh, mm -hmm. so you know we spent a fair bit of time together. So I finally came to the place where I was certain that I loved her and that uh, you know that I wanted to marry her, and uh, we actually went down to a place near the water where I proposed. And uh, and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. a very very good story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Koya Mike, um, have you been to the Philippines since you got married? Uh, we were there once, mm -hmm. and boy, is it three years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, so we uh, we were there six weeks. So we decided. Mm -hmm. I think for Arlene, it had been six years since she had been back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, quite a while for her. So, um, uh, had a great time. All right. So, um, what did you feel uh, when you, once you arrived in Laia International Airport in Manila? Yeah. Uh, Beside it, that very hot It wasn't that hot. Weather. Well, we, no? well, we went in January and February. Ah, so, I think okay. it was perhaps the best time of year. It wasn't too hot, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't rainy, so you know mm -hmm. that's you know what we were trying to avoid. Uh, so it was good temperature. Um, you know, Anna Lisa, uh, Arlene's sister, was there, yeah. so it was good to meet her for the first time. So you know, spent time in Manila, and uh, I don't know if you know this, but there's more people in Manila than there are in Glasgow. And because because you were in the <laughs> province, but like in Manila is really oh, it's a big city. city yeah. yeah, so we we traveled uh, traveled a lot, through, you know, through the city. Mm -hmm. So we you know met Arlene's um, uh, sisters. I think her sisters were living in Manila. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, we had heard that there was a Tim Hortons in Manila. Oh, really? And uh, <laughs> so then one day we decided to go to a place called you know uh, it was um, uh, uh, called Venice. You know, his designs look like Venice. Venice. Um, yeah. And so, you know, they have, actually have a canal, and uh, it's quite impressive, and the buildings are made to look like Venice. So as we were approaching it, we, we saw a Tim Hortons on the corner. So we knew there was a Tim Hortons. And uh, as we approached the door, it says writing on the, the writing on the door was, Welcome to Canada. <laughs> and I thought, well, good for Tim Hortons. And it was, you know, beautiful uh, building, uh, you know, very nicely done. So have you felt you're in Canada? Uh, <laughs> it was, it was just like an island being, uh, it was almost like an embassy. <laughs> that this land belonged to Canada. It was Tim Hortons. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just come to think of my mind, Kuya Mike, that uh, is the weather in Spain and in the Philippines the same or? Uh, quite similar. Maybe not as rainy. Uh, but uh, you know, similar. Spain is uh, far enough south. So it's and, also and tropical weather, right? Not tropical, but it's far enough south that it's warm. Oh, okay. Right. It does. It didn't snow in the winter. It might get cold. You know, you could see snow on the mountains in Spain, Ooh, but uh, there wasn't snow on the ground. Okay. Uh, maybe we had uh, a hint of snow in Spain once, 
but typically it's only in the mountains. Uh, some sim similarities, of course, between uh, Spain and... Uh, uh, I learned to speak Spanish, so I was a little familiar with uh, the Spanish words that are used in, uh, in Tagalog. Um, so what... Well, uh, we eventually went to uh, where Arlene's from, and uh, one day, I think there was as many as a hundred of her family members, we all went to the beach and brought the food and the night before we went uh, and uh, they, they ordered a pig and the following morning uh, the roasted, pig, the roasted pig. pig and the following morning you know, took the roasted pig uh, pig uh, uh, well it was a tricycle so took it back to the house and uh, did a lot of driving around the city to you know gather up the food and so we had a great uh, um, you know a great uh, you know family gathering on the beach and uh, so I think yeah, that was one one of the highlights. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like the water there in the beach? Oh, oh yeah. Well, <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. I like swimming. I like the water. <laughs> yeah. No, we went swimming. Uh, yeah. One time, someone had uh, you know the, the glasses. Mm -hmm. Not you know not really the snorkel, but we were able to you know use it. It was amazing how many colorful fish were under the water. So that was good. Yes. We went and saw Chocolate Hills. So that was great, and, and in Bahal. Yeah. Also over there in Bahal, you know, Arlene and I went on the zip line. Mm. So that was a you know, great experience. I didn't think she would do it, but uh, she, she often surprises you. So yeah. she was game, and so we went across, so. <clears throat> yeah. So for you, it's a nice experience. Oh yeah, no, we had a great trip. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's the gem in, the, in Spain? the best or highlight that you experienced in the in Spain? Uh, well, certainly the fact that that's where I was when I became a Christian. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you, know, and <clears throat> you know, living in a community, uh, I guess I viewed it afterwards as sort of living in a like greenhouse. You know, we had a, a very concentrated Christian environment. I, I think I thought afterwards that I had, if I wasn't in that situation, that I wouldn't have survived as a Christian. Um, that you know that allowed, allowed me to be well grounded and very confident in what I believed. And um, so you know I haven't wavered since. You know I've always been certain that you know Jesus is the truth. That our purpose here in this life is to um, you know to know who God is. You know He created us for a purpose. Uh, He's promised that we can be with him uh, for eternity, and uh, you know the, the word is used very lightly. It's you know in our language, but you know heaven is a real place. <clears throat> um, in the Philippines, what you like? What's the gem that you found in the Philippines? Um, <clears throat> Besides Arlene, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, just the, the Filipino people, mm -hmm. the Filipino culture. I mean, people were very open and very welcoming. You know, not just the you know people who were you know Arlene's family, but really you know anyone you met was uh, you know very open, and so it was a you know excellent trip. I yeah, really enjoyed it. We have to go back soon. <laughs> oh, yeah, I plan to go there. Well, not sure when, but uh, uh, you know, we should. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. Uh... Um, something in closing you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um. I think this this is the first time I've sat down for uh, you know, to is be it hot? Is to it be you're interviewed. On the hot seat? <laughs> uh, um, so uh, well, thank you for you know for interviewing me. I thank my you first time. so much, Kaya Mike, for having uh, here on my channel. And it's now you go by. <laughs> so look, everyone, subscribe, <laughs> like, and uh, keep watching uh, Ellie's channel. Thank you so much for your mic. Okay. God bless you. Okay. <laughs> okay.
ano? Wala ka frozen. Please click and subscribe. <laughs>